Greetings, members and friends of Emmanuel United Church of Christ. As always, so pleased that you've joined us here for our Wednesday Through the Bible study. We are beginning our look at Paul's epistle to the Colossians. It's a beautiful letter that speaks of the centrality of Christ and the importance of walking by faith. I'm excited to go through it with you. We are just going to look at the opening lines just to kind of intro ourselves to this. And since it's the beginning of Lent, we're going to focus particularly on faith and trying to understand what faith is just a little bit better. And so in order to begin our session, as always, I just want to read the opening lines of this epistle with you, and then we will reflect upon them. Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of the truth, the gospel that has come to you. Just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learn from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Is this passage will reflect upon in a message titled The Three Theological Virtues in Praise of Faith, Hope, and Love. Now, in the ancient world in which Paul lived, there were philosophers, and philosophers asked questions about life and life's significance and what it means to live life well. And the very fundamental philosophical question of all boils down to the simple question, what is the good life? And for the ancient philosophers, they boiled the good life down to what they called the four cardinal virtues. Cardinal, because cardinal comes from the Latin word cardo, which means hinge, which is a way of saying these four cardinal virtues are the foundation upon which all other virtues arise. It was made popular by Plato in his Republic and then made known to us through his disciple and student, Aristotle. And the four cardinal virtues that made for the good life were prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. Prudence is right reason applied to practice. It's our ability to judge correctly what is right and wrong in any given situation. So that if we mistake evil for good, we're not being prudent. We're showing our lack of prudence. So we are to make right decisions and exercise them rightly in our personal lives. And then you had the social dimension of righteousness with justice, that all should be treated equally and fairly. Young, old, rich, poor. Now in the ancient world, just as in our world, that wasn't quite done perfectly because the slaves didn't necessarily get fair treatment. But the idea of these cardinal virtues is we not only exercise prudence in our own decisions, but we exercise justice in social decisions. And then there was fortitude, which is the courage to do what is right to overcome fear and to remain steady in the face of obstacles so that prudence and justice help us decide what needs to be done personally and socially and fortitude is what gives us the strength to do it. And then finally there was temperance which had to do with restraining from excess, being somewhat self-controlled and disciplined. Aristotle spoke of the golden means, that we are not to indulge ourselves, which can have disastrous consequences physically and morally, but we are to keep from excess in our own lives. Now, these four cardinal virtues were the popular way of considering what the good life was. And they were popular for early Christians, in fact, through the influence of Aristotle. But the early church couldn't settle with four cardinal virtues. They added three more virtues so that there are seven virtues, the four cardinal virtues and the three theological virtues, the virtues of faith, hope, and love. 
And the early church got those theological virtues from the scriptures, and particularly Paul, who speaks quite a bit, joining together faith, hope, and love, as he does in the passage that we're looking at today. And the reason the church added these three theological virtues is because everyone can practice the four cardinal virtues, prudence, justice, fortitude, temperance. That can be practiced by anyone, but they understood that there was a little bit more to the good life and that good life involves a relationship with God. And the way we connect with God is not just simply through prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance, but it's through faith, hope, and love, all considered to be gifts of grace from God and virtues through which we as humans engage with God in a living and thriving relationship. And it's those three virtues that Paul extols in the letter we have before us. Let's look at this. Paul begins with this very short and brief and, and somewhat familiar introduction. He's writing from prison as he was in the epistle to the Ephesians. He's writing to a church that he has never personally visited. He'll speak about that in chapter two. And he speaks to the believers as saints or holy ones, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossae. And then he gives his normal greeting, grace to you and shalom, peace from God. And then he expresses his thankfulness. He is so thankful that the Colossians have heard the gospel and have responded with lives that are characterized by what we now consider the three theological virtues or the gifts of the spirit, the gifts of faith, love, and hope. And these virtues exist, according to the Apostle Paul, because the saints in Colossae have heard of this hope in the word of truth, the gospel. And they've come to truly understand or comprehend the grace of God. You can see the passages I've highlighted to see this in the text before us. They have heard the word of truth, and they've responded with faith, hope, and love, and they've truly comprehended the grace of God. Now, there's no single word that more accurately defines the essence of the Christian gospel than grace. They've come to comprehend it, not just have an emotional reaction, but they've heard the truth and they've comprehended or understood it, this truth that they've heard, according to verse 7, from their pastor, who is Epaphras, who is now visiting Paul and giving a report, and he's going to return with this letter to the Colossians. That's our passage. It's just an introduction. It's a gratitude for their faith, hope, and love that they've responded to God's grace, that they've heard about this grace that is extending throughout the world through their pastor, Epaphras. And what I want to do with this, since it's the beginning of Lent, and we're all thinking about nurturing our faith and growing in our devotion to Christ, I want to speak about why Paul praises faith so much. It's worth our while to reflect on that every now and then. What is it that makes faith and hope and love, but particularly faith, a virtue, a theological virtue? We all know faith is important. There are countless verses in the Bible to demonstrate that. We're saved by faith. Ephesians 2, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Jesus, in his gospel, says, repent and believe the gospel, or we have that wonderful passage in John, God so loved the world that God gave the only son so that anyone who believes will not perish, but will have eternal life. Paul writes in Romans, the just shall live by faith. And if you confess with your lips, Jesus is Lord and believe or have faith in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Or that wonderful passage in Hebrews 11, without faith, it's impossible to please God, for whoever would approach God must believe that God exists and that God rewards those who seek him. We are, by default, people of faith. We are those who say, in God we trust. We confess our faith, and thus it's important for us to understand what we are speaking about when we are speaking of faith, because it's about something more than just speaking. Faith shapes us. It's a virtue. It's a 
cardinal virtue, if you will. It's a hinge upon which everything rests. And what's very important for us to recognize that sometimes goes ignored is that faith has two dimensions. It has both a cognitive dimension of belief and a volitional dimension of trust. The Greek word for faith is pistis. And it's often hard to actually translate this word because it doesn't just mean believing something, assenting or affirming something in our mind. It also has to do with the volitional act of trusting. And so have these words in your mind, keep this screen kind of implanted in your mind, because as we reflect on faith, we need to recognize it is more than belief. It also involves a volitional element of trust. But both are important, because when we believe something, we are affirming or assenting that it's true cognitively. There are intellectual propositions or truths revealed in the gospel that we assent to or affirm. We believe that Christ died according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15. We believe that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ, Romans 8. We believe that because of Christ, we've seen God's benevolence and grace so that we understand God is for us and with us and in us. We've come to believe God is merciful and gracious and quick to forgive, that God so loved the world that Jesus died for our sins. All things that we affirm and assent to in our mind, that's the intellectual component of faith. But sadly, that's sometimes where we stop. We forget that pistis is not just belief, it is also trust. And trust is the active side of faith. It's where the rubber meets the road. It's where we volitionally or through an act of our will come to rely upon and depend on and surrender to God. Trust has to do with more than just thinking things. It has to do with relying and trusting in someone, placing our confidence and showing our commitment toward the one that we have intellectual knowledge of. And so when we think of faith, and Paul is affirming faith as a virtue, he commends the faith of the Colossians, we must understand he's not simply commending that they've affirmed a few things in their mind, but he is commending that they are personally trusting in God. And both of those dimensions are aspects of saving faith. Through faith, we believe intellectually that Jesus is the Son of God, the risen Savior, but it's in faith we trust in Jesus as the Son of God and as our Savior. We surrender to or confide in or give ourselves in reliance upon God, and it's that dimension of faith that is where the rubber meets the road, and it's that dimension of faith that makes faith active that causes it to, if you will, express itself in hope, looking forward, and to show itself in works of love. All of this is important because we all know, and we'll get to James eventually, years from now, I'm sure, that faith without works is dead. That faith has not just an intellectual dimension, but it has a volitional dimension. It, if you will, proceeds from our head to our heart, to our hand. There's a wonderful song our worship team sings that we'll come to before we conclude this message. But faith proceeds, not just from our head, as we believe certain propositions, but to our heart as we come to cherish those truths and see them as essential to all we are, and then to our hand as those truths are expressed in our life. And that's why Paul, in this opening passage, speaks of how he commends their faith being active, that their faith is bearing fruit in every good work. Because beliefs that don't, don't impact behavior are just opinions. They're just theories. We sometimes don't always put what's in our head into practice. Sometimes that's due to our own sin. Sometimes it's due to our lack of faith. We say we have faith, but practically we live as atheists. The test of faith is always, does it make a difference in the way we live our lives and in the way we treat others? 
So as this faith proceeds from head to heart to hand, it becomes an active force in our life, a force that Paul commends, and it becomes an enduring force in hard times, which is why Paul also commends hope, for hope is nothing more than faith looking into the future and recognizing the God who's shown us grace goes before us, and thus anchored in the grace of God, we move forward into the future, trusting that God is there as well. But this proceeding of faith from head to heart to hand finds its greatest expression in love. We know this. Galatians will come to next. Paul writes, the only thing that matters is faith working itself out in love. Jesus will say this, the only thing that matters, the thing that proves that you are my disciples, is that you have love one for another. So the cardinal virtues are important. They really do make for a good life. Prudence, doing the right things, that matters personally. Justice, seeking the right and the good and what's fair for all socially. Fortitude, the courage to do what's right, both personally and socially. And then temperance, restraining ourselves from indulgence. All are important elements of the good life, but anyone can practice those. We need a little bit more. In fact, we need a grace gift from God for the God life, to connect with God. And that's why Paul praises in this opening section what we now call the three theological virtues, that faith and hope and love matter, and that they all work in conjunction, in hinged form, if you will, so that faith moves forward in hope, working itself out in love. All of this is to allow us to reflect upon what is it that we believe? How does it inform and influence our life? Does it move us forward with courageous hope? Does it lead to works of love in the spirit? And insofar as it does, we can thank God that we've come to comprehend the grace of God who has given us the gift of the theological virtues, given us grace to live in faith and hope and love. And it is for the purpose of growing these virtues that Paul will continue his letter and we'll look at that in detail next week. But I think a great way to end this is if we were meeting and gathering in public, this is the song we would definitely sing because this song and its lyrics perfectly capture how this faith must move from our head to our heart to our hand, that it is the virtue that connects us to God and allows us to move forward in hope and to show love through the Spirit. I'm going to read the words. It'll be hard not to sing them. In this life, my days are few. Teach me how to honor you that each hour of every day worship you in all my ways. Show me, Lord, your precious heart, so indeed I show my faith. May I know your flawless will. May I live like heaven is real. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ. God is man, the sacrifice. That's that we believe. It's what we assent to. But it's more than that. Now I know your grace and love. May I love as Jesus does. May our faith inspire our deeds. May our deeds portray our faith, that our lives reflecting this worship you in heart and hand. And it is this whole life of worship that Paul is directing the Colossians' attention to. He commends their faith hope, and love, because it is through these grace gifts. You can call them grace gifts. You can call them theological virtues, whatever you call them. It is through the gift of faith and hope and love that we truly endure in this life, and we are able to express that same grace that's been shown to us in deeds of love to all the saints, as Paul writes, and to one another. 
I'm excited about moving forward into this. If we had taken many more verses, this message would be two or three times as long. So we will really dive deep next week. I just wanted to introduce this and allow you to reflect upon how faith, hope, and love are essential to the good life. Certainly the cardinal virtues matter. They're all good things. They're all spoken about in scripture, but they all fall short if they're not connected to the three theological virtues of faith, hope, and love, for it's through those gifts and graces that God gives us that we're able to connect to God and to reveal God's grace and love to this world. So we will uh, meet, as always, in our After the Through the Bible Zoom chat. The link is down below. Password is the same for regulars. If you need one, don't hesitate to contact Jenny or me. Uh, and until we meet again, I leave you with these words of benediction. May the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the blessed fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.